Welcome to Advancement Live. It is Tuesday at 1 p.m. Eastern. Let's talk advancement. We broadcast on the Higher Ed Live Network, a product of ED Universe Media. Find us at higheredlive.com and join in the conversation on Twitter using the Higher Ed Live hashtag. I am your host, Andrew Gosen, and I'm really excited about today's show. My guest, Miyoko Chu from Cornell's Lab of Ornithology, is going to walk us through one of the best case studies that I have ever come across of how an integrated communication strategy can advance an organization's strategic goals, including having a direct impact on the fundraising bottom line. Before diving into that ornithological awesomeness, however, I want to give a shout out to our Advancement Live sponsors, iModules and mStoner. iModules is the leading constituent engagement management provider for educational institutions iModules delivers an integrated online platform that transforms how institutions strengthen constituent relationships and achieve fundraising success. Speaking of success, next month, M. Stoner, a marketing communications agency focused on higher education web strategy and development since 2001, is presenting a three-part web analytics webinar series. You know the data that you're collecting is important, but how do you put it to use? How do you align this data with institutional objectives? And how do you take advantage of Google's advanced features like customized reporting, event clicks, or funnels? You'll get answers to these questions and sharpen your knowledge of Google Analytics with M. Stoner's webinar series. We're tweeting out a link right now where you can learn more about the series and register. Institutions can register for individual webinars or receive a bulk discount by signing up for all three. iModules and M. Stoner, we really appreciate your support in making conversations like these available to the broader institutional advancement audience. And now on to our show. Advancement Live has been banging the drum of crowdfunding and crowdsourcing pretty loudly over the past month. That, however, is not the focus of today's show. Today, we're talking about how social media, inbound marketing, content strategy, and a well-executed integrated marketing plan can have a direct impact on two different lines, the bottom line and your pipeline. However, as we get deeper into this, you'll find that 2013 may simply be the year of the crowd. The organization where today's guest works has been a pioneer in crowdsourcing, even in the pre-digital days, and I think a strong case can be made that this early recognition of the potential of the crowd has enabled the Cornell Lab of Ornithology to enhance its core research goals and thrive in today's digital world. And with that, let's turn to today's guest, Miyoko Chu. Miyoko is Senior Director of Communications at the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. She is an alumna of Yale College and a graduate of the UC Santa Cruz Science Communication Program. She earned her PhD in Integrative, integrative Biology at UC Berkeley studying a bird called the Thena Pepla. She has authored two books, Songbird Journeys, Four Seasons in the Lives of Migratory Birds, and Birdscapes, a pop-up celebration of bird songs and stereo sound. She is the principal investigator on an NSF-funded project to develop an artificially intelligent, interactive, online bird ID tool called Merlin that uses crowdsourcing to get smarter the more people use it. Miyoko, welcome to the show. Thanks, Andrew. So, Miyoko, let's set the stage for your case study by providing some context. Could you tell our audience a little bit about the Cornell Lab of Ornithology? Sure. Um, especially from a fundraising perspective, most people might not realize that the Lab of Ornithology is actually a hybrid institution. We're a part of Cornell University, but we're also a nonprofit, member supported environmental organization. So we receive about 99% of our funding from outside the university, and that includes about 37% uh, grant funding and 40% of our support from members and donors. And those donors are mostly non-Cornellians, unlike um, the university's audience. So that's one difference in terms of uh, when we're thinking about fundraising, who that audience is. And uh, there are people from around the country who care about birds and who want to donate to help our mission, which is to improve the understanding and protection of birds. And we do that through research, through education, through citizen science, or the crowdfunded data aspect of what we do, and through uh, conservation. 
And so aside from being a research institution, a huge part of what we do is engagement, providing information about birds that millions of people are looking for, crowdsourcing the data collection efforts, and inspiring people to protect what they love, ultimately. And so engagement and fundraising really go hand in hand. My own background is in bird study and word study. Um, it's not in fundraising, but um, I work closely with our senior director of development, Sean Scanlon, and his team. And uh, that's really what's been enabled us to, to venture forth in all the things that I'll talk about today. Before I dive into um, this talk, though, I want to show you all a short one and a half minute video about the Cornell Lab that'll just give you a sense of who we are and how we talk to people about engagement. Um, we were troubleshooting this a minute ago, and it sometimes worked well and sometimes didn't. If for some reason it's not working well, it's only one and a half minutes, we'll either be back or we'll abort. Um, but let's see what we can do. Let me try to go over here to YouTube. And here we go. It's taking a minute, looks like, to boot up. Looks like it may be taking a minute to boot. We'll give it another second, and if not, we'll just move on. Here we go. Uh, let me try a clip. One last time here. All right, video uncooperative. I'm going to try one last thing here with advancing forward and then back. Sorry, there's the mute button. Hope most of you were able to see that. Andrew, can you hear me okay? Okay, I'm not hearing you. So How about that? now yeah. I can hear you. All right, there we go. All right. I've still got I've still got the uh, music from the background from the next video, I think. Oh dear. Let me go in back in and try to turn that off. All right, I think we got it. You got it? Okay. All right, that was perilous. <laughs> all right, but it's all good. good. We're back now. I hope most of you were able to see that, too. Um, okay, so now you have a sense of uh, how we do our outreach, how we talk to people about engagement. Um, now, I want to mention something, which is unlike Audubon, we don't have chapters and centers across uh, the country. So to connect with people, we really rely on the web as our front door. And um, so our main portal is called allaboutbirds.org. 
And uh, that website is all about birds. It's not about us. It's not about the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. It's about birds. And that site gets about 10 million unique visitors each year and is distinct from our institutional site about us, which receives about 7 million unique visitors per year. So four years ago, um, we had this conundrum. It was like, great, we have all this web traffic uh, coming to All About Birds, but it kind of felt like sitting on the side of a highway and watching the traffic flow by. Millions of cars go by, and it felt like we were holding up these signs that said, join the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. And not a lot of people were taking action as a result of, of passive signs or buttons on our website. Um, most people have places to go and things to do and rarely hit that donate button. So our problem was that we needed to do something different. We had the audience, we had the traffic, but we needed to build an exit ramp, right, to funnel people closer to us, or we needed to be able to jump into their cars as they were passing by so that we could chat with them on the ride. And that's essentially what we've done using stories, social media, and inbound marketing. So with that, I'm going to share my screen. And go over to this presentation called the snowball effect. So Andrew, are you able to see the screen? I can. Okay, super. So I'm going to start by outlining some of our traditional communication channels and tell you how we were kind of stuck in trying to grow the engagement and the fundraising, um, stuck in that we weren't able to scale up as quickly as we wanted to, and then show you some of the changes that we put into place that are now creating what I call this snowball effect of audience growth, engagement, and uh, fundraising results. So here's the hill. You see at the bottom of the hill, there's a person pushing a snowball, and that represents the level of investment that we've made over the years in these communication channels. And let's start with print, because it's one of the oldest forms of communication um, channels that we have, and it's still in use today. This is our quarterly Living Bird magazine. Um, our supporting members at $35 and up receive this quarterly magazine. And traditionally the way that we've grown the audience around this magazine is through direct mail. So we would mail people we thought were interested in birds and we tried all different sorts of approaches, the approach of the letter inside the envelope, the envelope itself, the freebies that were stuffed into the envelope, the messages on the envelope. And no matter what we tried, we ended up with at best typically a 1% uh, response rate, which is good by direct mail standards, but you know, wasn't the volume that we were looking for to really grow rapidly, and is constrained by the number of lists that you can buy or the number of lists that will respond to you. So growth was steady, but not rapid. Now, here's another aspect of our engagement. Traditionally, you know, ever since 1965, um, we've engaged the public in sending data on birds to us that we use in scientific studies. And uh, you can see at the, in this top part of the circle, these are index cards where people actually would write down their data about bird nests that they had found and send it into the Cornell Lab of Ornithology to be analyzed. 300,000 of those records were sent in. Today we have numerous citizen science projects. These are little screenshots from different ones, um, including eBird, which enables people anywhere on the planet to submit a checklist of the birds that they've seen on any day, any time, and they can see those data and they can explore other people's data. And we get more than a million uh, observations every month through that citizen science project. Tremendous engagement. Typically, the way we try to grow participation is through mass media. Um, here's an example where we would try really hard, you know, to be placed on the Martha Stewart show, for example, um, and that would often result in a temporary increase in signups to our projects, but often didn't result in a huge scale change in participation or long lasting effects. So, again, we're a bit stuck in terms of growth. Um, 
it, it did growth has been increasing, but wasn't as rapid as we would hope to see. Um, now let's talk about engagement on the web and where we stood with that. This is a snapshot from our All About Birds website. Um, search engine traffic is really the main way that most people come to find our site. Once they're there, they can find you know, information on more than 500 bird species through our bird guide. They can find articles from our Living Bird magazine online. They get birding tips. Uh, we also have, are very strong in producing videos, so there's a whole series on um, inside birding tips. But the problem is, you know, we feel like we're creating all this great content, and yet if we're dependent on search engines to bring traffic to us, a lot of that content isn't being seen by people. How would you even know that you would want to Google birding, bird watching tips? And uh, so our, our traditional challenge with web has been, yes, we can create some great content, but how are droves of people going to find it if not through search engines? So in 2008, um, we started some social media efforts that have really helped to transform some of that. Um, we started out when we were redesigning our All About Birds website, doing a blog about the redesign, and eventually um, changing that into an engagement forum. Here's a post back from 2009 about, hey, we would love to put more photos on our website, but we need your help. We need your photos. Won't you come and contribute them to this Flickr page? And then we'll go and select some of these photos and feature them on our website. That effort today has grown to more than 3,000 contributors, and we still use these photos to populate our website. It's been great engagement. We also started a Facebook page in 2010. This is, harkens back to our very first post about the bird of the week. Um, but since then, we found ways to actively grow and engage the audience. Here's one of the most popular events that we do called March Migration Madness, where this year, Every one of our uh, programs who has a Facebook, so at the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, each citizen science project has its own Facebook page, for example. Um, and they each ask their own audiences to nominate a bird for March Migration Madness, basically their favorite bird. And then each week, these different birds would face off until we got to the final four and then eventually the chirpian ship. Um, and you know this was just hugely popular. Every week we would feature facts about each and then people would like the bird that uh, they wanted to vote for. And um, we always saw a bolus of new people liking our page because they wanted to participate in this contest. And so that's where we were as of a couple years ago. Now I'm going to show you what happens when we get up to this mountain where we start seeing all these investments roll down the hill and accumulates speed, audience, and engagement. So first, let's take a look at the web content. Here's a case where we have used a traditional media channel to drive to our live red-tailed hawk cam an article about the cam and people can see the embedded video or go watch this cam live. These are two uh, a pair of two hawks on the Cornell campus um, that have had a nest and raised their young on live cam for the past two years. So that's all well and good, but here's where it starts to get really interesting. The vast majority of people who come to the All About Birds website are Googling the name of a bird, and it so happens the red-tailed hawk is one of the most popular, most searched for birds. If you Google it, it's likely that All About Birds is going to come up in the top of those results. When you come to our page of natural history information about the red-tailed hawk, Here's what I mean by building that exit ramp to bring people closer. In the past, people would consume this information and then they would move on with their day and we might not ever hear from them again. We do have these passive donate now buttons, but again, people don't tend to push those and just donate. What's different now is that we have this watch live button that can take people, here's another banner down here, right to the watch the red-tailed hawk cam page. Now once they're here, they're looking at live footage of a bird that they 
indicated they were interested in by doing the Google search and landing on our page. And now they're watching this bird live. And not only are they watching it live, but there's a live chat scrolling next to that video window. The um, chats are moderated by volunteers, and they run from about 6 in the morning until 10 at night. And we found that this was just a tremendous source of engagement, where at the peak there are 8,000 people watching simultaneously, a couple hundred or uh, could be engaged in this live chat asking questions, sharing observations, and people watch this camera for just a really long time all throughout the season, and the uh, audience engagement is also very high. Um, 17 million web visitors come to our our sites, and this for the first time is one of the really exciting ways where we're seeing how to funnel some of those 17 million people into an interaction with us through those live chats. Now, it's one thing to have an interaction in a live chat, but how do you convert that to even building more of a relationship and then ultimately asking people to support the cause? And for that, we really rely on social media. So going back to the blog, you know, here's an example of a news item about Big Red. It's named after the Cornell Big Red sports teams. And she has laid her first egg. Uh, when people see that blog post, they tend to click over um, to watch the live event. On our Facebook page, we can also put out this announcement and very quickly reach people so that in moments they are flocking to the page. Here is an example of what that looks like once the young have grown up a little more. And uh, we get classrooms watching this. We have bird enthusiasts. We have people who didn't even know they were bird enthusiasts. And additionally, the moderators are tweeting events at the nest. So Big Red is sitting on the railing. Big Red departs. Big Red is back this time. You know, they'll mention what sorts of prey the birds bring in. And so this is constantly um, updating the community of followers about what the hawks are doing. This is all volunteer run again. Amazingly, the level of engagement is so high that the viewers themselves are quicker to post highlights than we are. So an event may happen on the nest, like an egg hatches or the hawks bring a snake into the nest, and within minutes, the community has posted on their own YouTube channels this footage. And um, that, again, helps spread the word out to audiences that we may not even reach, but the speed is incredible. The diversity of people participating is incredible. The archiving of this footage is at a level that we could not do with the level of staffing that we have. And uh, people also... Um, have an active Flickr presence, putting snapshots in there. And now what I want to do is show a highlights reel that we put together that was uh, made possible by all the hundreds of people who contributed screenshots off of the live footage, posted them on Flickr, and we were able to gather those images and do a highlights reel. And I just want to give you a sense of that community. Miyoko, we're gonna f can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, I was hearing on the back channel that no one saw the initial video, so maybe we should just oh, just let skip discretion the video? be the better okay. part of Valor here. Thanks. Yeah, so let's use our imaginations. Let me flip back to the screen here. Um, and may, we may be able to find a, a way to post a link in case people do want to watch this later. It's a video that has music in the background and that highlights the story of these birds through the images that the crowd um, basically put onto Flickr. Uh, let's see. At the end of that video, which then itself is passed along by the community, there's a little um, ask for donations to support the CAM. That brings people to this donation page. And the response has just been tremendous for people wanting to support this type of effort. So to sum up a little bit about the sense of scale, uh, we now have 150,000 Facebook fans, um, 169,000 photos posted on Flickr, not only of the hawks, but of all kinds of birds, and 9 million uh, views on YouTube. Now, this is, to me, where things get especially interesting, okay? And this is uh, where we bring in inbound marketing. The idea that we really want to look around to where people are coming to us for content, 
and going and meeting them there and providing more information of the kind that they're looking for in order to build a longer term relationship and eventually ask them for support. So here's an example using the Hawks. Uh, this Facebook post reminds people that we're inviting them to participate in our Guess the Hatch contest. Uh, you can put in your guess for when the egg is going to hatch. When you click the link to participate, you come to this page and it shows you the prize that you could win and it uh, prompts you to put in a, uh, a date and a time and your contact information, your email, and then your address is optional. Zoom that in a little bit more. And uh, we found that this contest, just over the course of a week or so, led to 2,500 new leads, that is people we'd never heard from before, um, entering the contest and providing their name and, and email address. It mentions that by including their email address, they will receive our monthly news and BirdCams news. And uh, this effort resulted in a 34% conversion of people um, basically doing this activity from the page. Once we have that email address, we're able to directly give people the information they're looking for right in their email box. And that's what I meant by jumping in the car and going along for the ride with someone rather than standing on the side holding up a sign. Um, what happens is we're able to put the news right into their email box so that wherever they are, they are able to get the news that they're looking for from us. You can also see that in addition to the Hawk News in this case, we're promoting our big day fundraiser and uh, reporting back on uh, some results from another fundraising effort. And additionally, we talk about other things, other ways of engagement at the lab. You know, the fact that you can enter a photo contest um, or how you can support um, student research by um, of pledging them, them to support their uh, big day competition. It's basically a competition to see how many birds they can find in 24 hours and you pledge per species. And what we found, remember when I talked about direct mail, well we still do direct mail, but this way of inbound marketing and harvesting names, growing a relationship, and then talking to people in this more targeted way through direct mail, knowing, for example, that people had come in through the door of the bird cams, enables us to write to them to ask for support of the bird cams, uh, led to a 23% revenue increase for this particular appeal over the previous year. So what's really been revolutionary is, is our ability to scale up that e-news subscription list through these inbound marketing techniques. Um, and additionally, we have a Google grant that helps us um, through a different channel reach different audiences for lead capture. But the inbound marketing has been huge. In terms of this particular Hawk example, um, we had 2,544 CAM donations. 58% of those people were new donors. We received more than 1,000 new supporting memberships, 91% new members, which is phenomenal, um, resulting in a total of $154,000 for that season. Um, and this fed into other successful fundraising efforts that year. Um, for comparison, our other biggest fundraiser is uh, the Big Day fundraiser, 350K, our year-end appeal. Um, again, we saw 36% new donors, which we attribute in part to the CAMS, as well as other um, inbound marketing efforts, and an increase of 150% in online giving. And here is an example of all that effort, the stories, the social media, the web engagement, and the fundraising and inbound marketing that you can see the growth since uh, fiscal year 10 in blue um, and the purple now in fiscal year 13. So our mission, right, the reason we're asking people to support us um, has to do with engagement, understanding birds, protecting birds. We had more than 3 million fans following the uh, Hawk cams. Uh, we had 8 cams in total featuring different birds, more than 31 million views, 
This is a really sticky form of content. More than a thousand years of viewing time if you add up everyone's collective viewing time for these cams over the course of two years. Um, and people have been watching from 176 countries. We're really you know, happy that the depth of engagement is so tremendous as well. We have comments from classrooms who are watching the Hawks. We have teachers who say that the CAMs teach more, bi more biology by accident than any intentional classroom lesson. Um, I love this one from an 81-year-old who says, thank you for the wonderful view. You've given me a view I never dreamed I would see. Um, people have sent us artwork of the birds. They've sent us poetry. Um, the outpouring from the community is just tremendous. Now, I want to pause here just to show another example very briefly because you don't have to have a fancy bird cam or any kind of live cam um, to take this idea. Um, here's an example with static content. Someone has Googled owl, they come to our snowy owl page. Instead of just consuming the content and leaving, they see this button for download free owl sounds. Okay? When they hit that, they get the opportunity to download their free sounds in exchange for, again, putting in their email address and the opportunity for them to receive our email correspondence. Um, the tool that we use is called HubSpot. It enables us to set up all of this um, landing page and email correspondence automatically so that on day three, after signing up, for example, you might get this letter from me. Thank you for downloading the sounds. And, oh, you might be interested in our Voices of North American Owl CD. Maybe 10 days after they've signed up, they'll get a message telling them about our um, program where you can learn how to set up a nest box for owls or other birds and then engage in citizen science and tell us what bird nested there and how successful those birds were. And this helps drive uh, citizen science participation, as I mentioned before, we relied on mass media. Now we have this additional channel of people who've already told us, I'm interested in owls, and maybe they're interested in reporting on owls or other birds in this Nest Watch citizen science project. Or in the project where you can watch birds at your feeder. We also use uh, social media to drive to citizen science projects. Here's a bird spotter photo contest where people submit their images. We feature the winners on Facebook. And we talk about Project Feeder Watch, which is for people who love to watch birds at feeders. Maybe they'd like to contribute data to help with the understanding and protection of birds. And this last quick example is about our Birds of Paradise project, where we were really fortunate to have um, this incredible confluence of a documentary produced about these birds, a traveling exhibit about them, a National Geographic book, um, and a, a new website. And so here's a, a case where instead of using static content, we produced a video about these birds. It went viral and got more than 2 million views. Um, at the end of the video, it mentions download free Birds of Paradise sounds, and you can see where that's heading. Um, it enables us to capture the email addresses of people and write to them to tell them about the documentary, remind them of lectures going on in their region, and provide support for projects like this. This is an educational website all about the Birds of Paradise that is made possible through the generosity of all those members and supporters who heard about the project. So with that, um, I just want to mention that obviously this is a tremendous amount of effort that really requires integrated teams to work closely together. And here um, I've included the names of, of some of those people. So that's it for the presentation. And I just want to thank everybody for listening. And now I will switch back to Kim. Awesome. Miyoko, thank you so much. Uh, this is the third time that I have I've heard you talk about this. And I find that I, I focus on different aspects of it every time. Uh, the volume of the numbers that you're talking about sort of blow my mind. 
the, the lucidity and the elegance of a person's journey through the various different pieces of the puzzle um, is a marvel to see, I think. And I've been around digital long enough to recognize that that's probably not accidental. That's probably the result of an incredible amount of, of hard strategic thinking and, and good creative work. So my first question today is one that I think gets right to the heart of content strategy and digital engagement in 2013. Um, it feels to me as though one of the main reasons that what you've just described to us is working as well as it is, is that you have prioritized your audience's interests and needs over any sort of old school centralized messaging framework. Um, do you think that's a fair assessment? Um, I would say that it has been an evolution and is still a work in progress. So certainly, in my 11 years being here, we started with that traditional messaging framework. And over time, what we learned was we looked where the traffic was going. And um, just for example, on the All About Birds website with those 10 million people, more than 80% of those people are going to that, those bird pages, just pages about bird information. 16% um, go to the bird cams, 2% go to the editorial, it's about how to bird watch, how to attract birds, and a paltry 1% are coming to all the news articles uh, that we're producing and the articles about our own work. Okay, so in terms of emphasis, I would say that's flopped, where in the past we put most of our effort and time into creating that content about ourselves, and we still do a lot of that, maybe disproportionately to the amount of traffic, um, it's actually the case that the traffic is coming to us for a different reason, which is great, and we want to keep fostering that, but then, of course, our question was, how do you get that traffic to become interested in or to be exposed to all that messaging framework that we're also still doing? It's basically, how do we connect the two? That's interesting. Hearing you describe that reminds me of that classic XKCD comic strip about the university website where it's a Venn diagram and on one side it's what's on a university website and on the other side it's what people come to a university website looking for and the only thing in the space in the middle that they have in common is the institution's name and that, that's such a beautiful illustration for me of the, the disjuncture between our own perceptions of how interesting the stuff that we produce because we do it on a daily basis is and what people are actually looking for um, so I think, I think the process you just described really gets right to the core of, of paying attention to what people are doing and then doing your best to respond to what they're indicating to you that, that they're interested in. So here's right. a question. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, there's lots of talk on social media about social listening and trying to hear the conversations that are taking place either in channels that an organization is maintaining or that are or happening organically out in the wild. What I'm, I'm taking away from hearing you express what you just expressed is that, that simply paying attention to your Google Analytics on your website is also an important piece of, of listening, and perhaps it's the most important piece because it actually provides you with sort of a heat diagram of aggregate activity in areas instead of trying to drill down to the individual level. Yeah, I mean, that's been the most valuable lesson for us is... Um, if we want to continue growing our audience, it's important for us to understand what it is they're coming to us looking for. Um, and then once they're there, I think people are more receptive to um, wanting to support you if you've provided, if you've continued to provide them something in a more personal way. So instead of them getting the passive information on the website, hearing from you through e-news seems to be a big step in this process. And what they're doing is giving us a chance to talk to them through email by indicating their interest in the subject matter that they're coming to us for, rather than us trying to interest them at the outset in something that they may not have an initial interest in at all. Right. And I know that there's lots of concern out there in the nonprofit world about the whole issue of spam and people getting exhausted with email. But it, it feels to me like you have you've taken the sort of mandate to provide value to the user that we see in the social web and you've ported that over to email in such a way that it's not an imposition for people to receive any email from you because you're actually providing valuable content that you know they're interested in as you that's, do that. That's what we're hoping. You know, we always have that sidebar in there with some sort of ask or reminder that we rely on donations, but we have to make sure that 
everything else is interesting enough to stand on its own and make it be worth that open uh, click. So something else I was thinking about, especially looking at the graph of your, your fundraising revenue over the years as a result of all this, is that it, it feels like this is a process that takes months, if not years, to actually refine and implement and, and get the ROI that you probably were hoping for at the beginning of the process. How have you managed internal expectations about how fast this process developed? Well, I mean, I think it's exceeded all expectations in terms of the rapid growth of engagement. And really, one of our biggest challenges is um, keeping up with that level of response. So it's a nice position to be in, right, to realize that the amount of activity that we're generating now itself requires more support. You know, for example, to do these live chats requires a tremendous level of of support for moderators for the community. Um, live chats are very volatile um, and it takes a lot to manage that in addition to simply managing the uh, responses that are coming in. So in one version of my presentation I had thought about putting a, a skier on this downhill slope who's about to be overtaken by this snowball and that represents for example the membership team who has to process uh, donations. It represents all of the infrastructure that we need to scale up. Um, so I think it, it's it's really kind of exciting to have gotten to the point where it's a good problem to have. We're starting to see a lot of activity. How do we make sure that we're capable of managing that and then continuing to grow that? I've always admired one of the the aspects of your management of some of these chats. It's not just someone there who is acting as a, a host and sort of catalyzing conversation, but you often have actual science writers in there who bring subject matter expertise to the topic at hand, adding play-by-play -play commentary that adds value from the viewer's perspective as you go along. And that just feels like another expensive investment of, of human resources and making sure that this is a good and a positive experience for the, the viewer. Yeah, that's especially true on Facebook. It actually turns out that on the live cams, most of the work is done by volunteers, and we wish we had more time to have guest um, appearances by scientists. Um, but with Facebook, for example, um, we had a traditional science writer editor who's now in charge of that social community, and boy, it takes a lot more um, time and thought and effort than most people, most of us realized going into it. Um, in order to make it that level of uh, engaging, in order to have people keep coming to it and liking the page. So that's another important learning that we've had. We can't just put a page up. It really needs a human being behind it who puts a lot of time and thought into it. Right. Has the volunteer dimension of that evolved organically, or did you actually set out to recruit volunteers to tend to things in the chats around the webcams? It evolved completely organically. Um, the story is that we were using live stream to um, stream the cams and it comes with a live chat function. And when we launched the cams, our project leader, just for kicks, um, activated the live chat and people started chatting instantly and he s quickly realized that this was going to be a full-time job. If he was going to leave the chat up, he would have to stay there the whole time. But um, people who were in the chat started volunteering to ban trolls and to keep an eye on things and they weren't necessarily people who had a lot of bird expertise but they loved the cams and they wanted to make sure that the social community could keep interacting and so this year we had more than 30 uh, volunteers and they took shifts and uh, were in charge of just making sure it was a safe and engaging environment for all the people in the live chat. Do you provide them with any sort of training or quality control or do you just trust them and they repay your trust by doing a good job? We have a very brief orientation in the beginning and we have a, a handbook of guidelines for people. Um, it's not nearly enough in the sense that they're fantastic people, do a tremendous job, but we've really learned from these live chats 
that there's so many potential minefields with it. Um, human dynamics online, uh, people who make controversial comments, um, crises occurring, disagreements, philosophical, uh, you know, disagreements and personality clashes. And um, we've learned that we need to train ourselves better in how to manage that and then train the trainers um, so that they feel equipped and comfortable to be able to handle those kinds of things too. Could you give us a sense of the sorts of misbehaviors, well, you've explained what the sorts of misbehaviors are, but are there are particular techniques that seem to work for managing those outside of just flat out banning people from chat? Well, I think the most important thing we've learned is to, as an institution, be very transparent and clear and quick in, in your response to any sort of crisis in the chat, whether it's a personality conflict or whether something's happening to the birds that people are really worried about. And um, what is really important is to have that instant connection to the influencers, who in this case are the moderators. They're the ones who are at ground zero hearing the questions and who are affected by that dynamic. They have to be able to have a direct line to us so that they can get information, guidance, or whatever support they need. And so for every situation it's different. In some cases we um, would even call someone who has been having a difficult time in the chat um, and talk with them and explain how it's affecting the moderators and how it's affecting other people, um, even at that level, rather than outright banning them, for example, because some people don't realize their dynamic in the chat and how it comes across to others. It's scary to do that when it's sort of asynchronous, like on a Facebook page, and the notion of doing it in real time on an ongoing basis is actually quite terrifying to me. So I, yeah. I salute the fact that you all have figured <laughs> out a way to make this work. Another, another question that I've been noodling over is the issue of the speed at which the digital space is evolving. And clearly, you all got on the Flickr back when Flickr was hot, and that paid really nice dividends for you. Now you're sort of on the cusp of, you're on the cutting edge of, of a really innovative deployment of live streaming. As you're monitoring the space, how do you decide when it's time to back away from a platform that has served you well in the past and when it's time to start experimenting with something new? Well, it's kind of funny because I feel like we've hardly ever backed off on any channel. I mean, we're still doing as much print as we've ever done before, much to my surprise. Um, all the traditional channels I talked about, including direct mail, are only growing. And so I haven't found any communication channel to ramp down yet. And this gets to be overwhelming when every year there's some new social media platform to learn about and to learn about whether we should ramp up in it. Um, so that's our basic story. It's doing all of the traditional and doing more of it, but also doing more new things and doing more of it. Do you have any sort of rubric that you apply when you're testing a new channel and trying to figure out if you're going to take the plunge or not? Well, um, as one example, we started to uh, dip our toe in the water with Pinterest, just with a particular campaign or two uh, to see what the effect was. And um, I haven't seen the results back yet to know whether that's worthy of a more investment, but, but there are actual ways we can test that, where we can do a particular campaign, follow up with a particular lead capturing opportunity, and then look at the response rate from that group. Okay, so it's all sort of data-driven experimental testing of premises. And then Ideally, works, yes. Okay. <laughs> well, that's all you can ask for is an, an ideal. Um, so back to the webcams, I would say that yours is one of the most ambitious and successful deployments of webcams that I've ever come across, and I had a, a very personal uh, realization of, of the extent of your success one day last spring when I talked to my brother-in-law in Nevada and my mom in Santa Fe within about half an hour of each other and they were both watching the hot cam. <laughs> nice. um, what have you learned from this experience and are there any best practices that you could share with our audience pertaining to the deployment of webcams? Okay. Well, what we have learned is just the tremendous power of community and the depth to which this community takes on a life of its own. So in this particular case, we have people in the community who have become friends with each other, have set up their own Facebook pages to keep in touch with each other. Um, a group of people from around the country who follow the cams is coming here um, in a couple of weeks. Um, 
as sort of a reunion, an in-person reunion. So this is one of those cases where we see an online community going full circle back to um, in-person communities. And um, another powerful example of this community is uh, recently, two of the young hawks uh, died um, that everyone had watched ever since they had hatched out of eggs. Um, and one is believed to have uh, collided with a vehicle or a building, and the other uh, had some severe leg injuries from some human-made apparatus. We don't know what it is. Well, so people locally want to know what they can do. Um, they've already started inquiring with the state highway department about wildlife crossing signs and raising awareness of traffic speed at the places where these birds hunt. A more even more astounding example is in New York City where there was a live cam on a hawk that died from uh, rodenticide poisoning and uh, eventually rodenticides were banned in um, Washington Square Park because people who were so passionate and who had connected with the birds and connected with each other through live cams uh, and through watching individual birds managed to take an action that is going to help not only those particular birds but all the birds in the area. Um, so that's an example of the power and the passion of the community and if I could share what I've learned from the cams it's very interesting I think the key ingredient is the live chat there are other cams out there including some of ours that don't have a live chat component but they do have a commenting feature like a Facebook feature that don't have nearly the same level of engagement both in terms of number of people amount of time spent on the site and amount of response uh, in terms of donation and engagement so there's something about the live chat that is really special. Not sure exactly what it is. Someone could do a whole study on this, mm -hmm. but we know that's critical. And for us, the challenge is how do you manage those very, uh, you know, volatile, potentially risky um, chats, especially when they're going on for months at a time, from six in the morning till ten at night. Yeah, this notion of of the real time chat as a community experiences together events in real time it's it's ringing real bells for me thinking about what's happening with regard to TV and the second screen phenomenon where you've got groups of people who are all watching True Blood or Breaking Bad or whatever it is as it is playing and then they're interacting with each other on the back channel using their mobile devices and it, it feels like there are actually some pretty significant parallels between that and having it all integrated into one one live stream platform um, focused on something like a bird cam but I think you're absolutely right that there's some sort of magic in this group experience of a, of of progress in a in a shared common interest. Yeah, there are players in the story. We're not passively watching content anymore. We're taking right. part in it and we're shaping it, which is pretty amazing. Well, and the fact that people then take the next step and they will actually capture something and share it onto YouTube yeah, right. the community or write haikus. I mean, that's that's pretty impressive stuff. I I await the day that we start seeing a significant amount of haikus written about uh, <laughs> our, our institutions and sent on right. it. So I think that's right. pretty remarkable. Um, <laughs> finally, let me ask a question that I'm, I'm sure many viewers will have. Um, what does it take to make something like this happen in terms of, of staff and budget and simply advanced planning? I know you showed us that screen there at the end of your presentation that had a number of names on it. Mm -hmm. um, but how how much could a small shop aspire to running something like this? Right. Um, well, I'll give you a sense of maybe some of the scale involved with our own team. So we have now a full-time online marketing manager who really does one HubSpot campaign after another, strategically thinking about where all that traffic is and how she can spawn. You know, I gave you three examples of those types of lead capture campaigns just do that across as many big channels as we can. So that could be a full-time person if you want to really fire on that that opportunity all the time. And we're just uh, in the process of hiring a second uh, position to support that type of effort. In addition, um, we have three science editor writer um, types who one of them focuses on Facebook and e-newsletters and generating uh, in the blog and generating a lot of content 
another who focuses on mass media and generating a lot of content, and a third who focuses on development writing, those direct mail letters, for example, annual reports, um, and generating a lot of content. So it's not that you need three people to do this, but at least you know, realizing that that role is important and it could be um, you know, a person dedicated to each of those types of channels depending on how much of it you want to do. Um, additionally, we have a web team who can really be there for tech support on all this content, and the BirdCams project has a staff of two um, just for that one project. Um, and we, you know, as a, a large team, we have about 20 people on our communications team, five in a multimedia production team, and then uh, you know, a handful of staff in development. Altogether, that's a lot of staff. Not that every organization needs to have that many people to do this type of effort if you're more focused. Um, but we have a lot of content and a lot of programs, a lot of delivery potential, which is why we have so many people. Let's, let's sort of wrap things up with that whole issue of, of focus. Um, I mean, to a certain extent, it feels like a large part of, of why your efforts are as successful as they are is that you are able to focus on birds and the bird community. And I know that birders are, are a special breed of sorts and that they tend to be extraordinarily passionate about, about their interests. Um, do you think that, that there's just something special about birds that makes this level of sustained interaction possible? And there's a, there's a comment here on the back channel saying that birds are the new kittens. So perhaps we can posit <laughs> that this would work equally well for some sort of a feline research facility. Um, do you think there's anything unique about birds that makes this as engaging as it is? Or do you think the principles can be abstracted and then deployed productively in, in other contexts? Well, it's funny that you mentioned about kittens, because I was going to say we're very envious of the places you get to talk about kittens. But yes, absolutely, these principles can be applied to, I think, any theme. And I would be interested to explore more if your theme is students, if your theme is research or a university mission. How would you use those principles? What themes would you pick? And um, certainly the idea of figuring out where your alumni audience goes, like what content is most interesting to them, would just be a great place to start. And then to try to find out, okay, you know, what could we do that would foster a deeper level of interaction online through email once we we had them. I mean, I guess you're at an advantage at a university because you already have the emails, so that's not necessarily the challenge, but really more to find out what what are people going to connect with, um, and how can you talk to different audiences in a real targeted way that speaks to each of them. I think one of the big lessons that the digital revolution has passed on to people working in advancement is that the days of the one-size-fits-all communication and engagement strategy are over. <laughs> that just doesn't work anymore. Right. Miyoko, thank you so much. It's been a real pleasure talking to you. And thank I'm sure you. I'm not the only one who will be checking out the webcams um, from time to time, having, having enjoyed what you've had to say about this. Um, that ends our hour. Ryan Catherwood will be back to host Advancement Live next week with a brand new show featuring guests from across the pond. That's right. Advancement Live is going international. Ryan will be joined by Jade Bressington from the University of Birmingham and Bruno Van Dyke from the Durham University to discuss the changing higher ed landscape in the United Kingdom. As always, you can watch more shows from Advancement Pros on the Advancement Live archive located at higheredlive.com. Thanks to everybody who turned in live. Thank you, Miyoko, again, and see Thanks you next so time. Thanks so much.